Good morning, everybody. My name is Nolene Hartigan, and I'm your chair this morning for this final of the public webinar series in this part of the Words Ireland Project on Diversity and Inclusion. For anyone who'd like to use them, um, there is a closed captions option for this meeting, so you just need to click that button. And we'd encourage people to add their pronouns beside their name um, if you have an opportunity to do so. So as I said, my name is Nolene, you'll have heard, this session is being recorded. That's just to enable people to watch back who can't join us today. By way of introduction to the project in the first instance. So Words Ireland is a collective of seven literature organizations, including Children's Books Ireland, the Irish Writers' Centre, Literature Ireland, the Munster Literature, Poetry Ireland, Publishing Ireland, and Stinging Fly. Um, and Words Ireland won a capacity building award from the Arts Council to do some work collectively for the first time on diversity and inclusion in 2020. And today is the final public part of that phase of the work, but I suppose it's important to stress that it has been just a one year project so far, and we are just at the end of phase one. So in a moment, I'm going to talk you through those different elements to the project so that you can see the other work that we've been doing and what our aspirations are and what we've been learning along the way. But before I do, I want to introduce our panelists. Those of you who've been with us for the other webinars will know that our first webinar was on uh, the research that was undertaken early in the year. The second one was on the Charter for Inclusion that we're working on, uh, which I'll speak to in a little while. The uh, next one was on what's happening in the literature sec section. Goodness me, can't even pronounce right. What's happening in literature. So we had some wonderful examples from organizations both within and outside of Words Ireland. And today we're taking a further step back and we're looking at what's happening across different art forms that can inform our practice. Um, I'm personally very excited. Some of the most interesting women I know in the sector are presenting today and um, people that I've learned a huge amount from um, over the years. And I'm hoping that we will all have great questions for them. And um, we have a mixture, I suppose, of hope and sobriety, I would say, across our panelists, uh, people that are pushing the boundaries and pushing the edges of participation, and also those that have rigorous evidence to say that when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're also talking about including people in a sector that is not safe. Uh, we know from our own that in literature is extremely bad, and that obviously is interconnected with our hopes for increased diversity. But we also know um, from the Speak Up project by the Irish Theatre Institute that we're not inviting people into a safe sector and that we have to address our own culture before we expand it in any way. So to that end, I'm, I'm very happy that we have Siobhan Burke, co-director of the Irish Theatre Institute, and Dr. Kieran Mur Murphy, who is the lead researcher on Speak Up Call for Change. And the women are going to speak to that research um, and, and what it means for us as a sector. Uh, we'll also be joined by Professor Deborah Kelleher of the Royal Irish Academy of Music. I've learned a huge amount from Deborah. I'm particularly interested to hear about the concept of artistic excellence. So we hear about this all the time when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. But what about the artistic? Where is the excellence? How are we maintaining standards as we change and change up art forms? And for me, the Royal Irish Academy of Music are an extraordinary example of that. So Deborah's going to put, speak to their new strategic plan, which, which puts diversity and inclusion at the, at the heart of their strategy, but also specifically about their Open Youth Orchestra and, and the wonderful new art forms that they are creating. We'll also be joined by Lynn Scarf, who's director of the National Museums of Ireland. Lynn is a very passionate and, and robust advocate for the participative museum. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from Lynn about how we have meaningful engagement in public spaces for underrepresented audiences, or as we've previously called it, a permission slip, just because a space is open or indeed free 
do you see yourself in that space? And will you cross the threshold? And will you have a voice and see your stories told? So I'm really excited to hear from Lynn. And finally, we were joined by Maureen Canelli, Director of the Arts Council. Thanks to everybody who gives up an hour and a half on a Tuesday morning, but particular thanks to Maureen for giving up an hour and a half because we'd all want that meeting with her. <laughs> um, but thank you, Maureen. Maureen's going to wrap up the panel discussion with her own reflections um, on where the Arts Council is in its own journey on this, what the challenges are, where she sees this moving forward. And I guess Maureen, how all those different themes of equality, diversity and inclusion, public space and pay the artist all combine um, and how we can bring that into, into practice at a day-to-day -day basis across our organizations. So that's our fabulous panelists. I'm going to stop talking very soon. Um, but before I do, I'm going to do that thing that gives me the fear every single time. The fear used to be, you know, when you'd wake up on a Saturday morning, you go, what, what, who was I talking to last night? The fear is now when you go to share screen on Zoom and you're truly terrified. Uh, but I'm going to do that now and talk you very quickly through the project for anyone who wasn't on any of our previous webinars. But before I do, can I just check, um, does anyone have any questions about the format of today? Wonderful. I'm thinking what we will do is hear from all of our presenters, bar Maureen, open it up to questions from everybody, and then ask Maureen to offer her reflections. Does that seem like a reasonable way to spend our time? Lovely. I'm seeing some nods and no objections, so I'll crack on. So firstly, just briefly, everyone, the Words Ireland uh, project has four elements. Um, the ones in grey are the public ones that the rest of the art sector has seen. Um, but over here in green is me in a little box, uh, working with the seven Words Ireland organisations since the very start of this year on a framework for diversity and inclusion. And I suppose that framework really acknowledges that this isn't just about the artists that we programme or the, the work that we commission. To be real about diversity and inclusion requires a root and branch analysis of our own organizations, about where we hold power, about how we make decisions, about how we're prepared to change, about who we're prepared to not only invite in, but actually listen to. And so we've been working on a framework, which I'll share in a moment, and each of the seven organizations who are all in their own different stages of development in this debate have been reflecting on that internally, and having debates at a board and staff level and adopting or revising policies. So that's the homework in the background. We hope that that framework will be superseded by much more rigorous tools from much greater authorities than us. And we look forward to the development of the Arts Council's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Toolkit. But in the meantime, that was the work that we were doing ourselves, if you like, getting our, our own houses in order. We also published a charter and I'll speak to that in a moment. Um, we published research by Heather Maitland and that research looked at both paying conditions in the sector, but also um, diversity across writers, illustrators and arts workers. The and there's information on it on the Words Ireland website. Some of the findings are complex and some of them will require a lot more digestion and because the numbers were, were relatively small, it also challenges us not to, to really go deep and try and understand individual experiences. But I suppose the two key takeaways from that research were firstly, the pain conditions across the sector, both for writers and those working in the sector are extremely low. And secondly, that our sector is not in any way reflecting yet the diversity of the country that we live in. Um, not hugely surprising, um, but nonetheless a point of pause and reflection for everybody. And then finally, this webinar series, and I've mentioned the webinars that we've had. So just very briefly, and you're, you've got about four minutes of noting left. So the framework, just to contextualize it for everybody, we looked at our organizations through nine lenses. Um, we looked at whether the organizations had a clear value statement, on equality, diversity, and inclusion, 
whether it was robust to the governance level, including whether there was diversity within the board, whether the board had adopted a policy, spent money on the issue, had accountability for who was doing what. We looked at HR and operations. How are we hiring? Who are we hiring? Where are people working? Where are our audiences being invited into? We looked at staff and board capacity building. So everything from uh, diversity awareness training through to broadening our artistic horizons. What are we reading? Who are we reading? Who do we talk to? How do we define excellence? We looked at data and the importance of actually capturing data on diversity and inclusion and doing that in an ethical and meaningful way that didn't further extract stories from audiences that are being asked all of the time and seeing no results. We looked at programs with artists and programs for audiences. And right now the framework document is shared by all seven organizations and we're constantly adding new ideas that we're seeing about how to support emerging artists and how to program with and for audiences and not just expect more diverse audiences to come unless the art is meaningful. And then finally, we looked at two other areas, impact measurement. How do we know we're doing a good job? And I suppose a personal concern is that there is going to be a flurry of activity around diversity and inclusion, but maybe not enough reflection and learning time built in and not enough co-design with underrepresented artists and audiences. And then finally, how do we communicate our story um, and how do we represent the artists that we work with in an ethical way? So, and then finally, the charter, many of you will be familiar with this. This charter is for World Ireland organisations. It's absolutely not the be all and end all. It is not a code of behaviour. There will be other codes of behaviour, and I hope you'll hear more about that from Siobhan and Kira about what's coming down the line. Um, so this is not something that people must sign, but it's something that World Ireland organisations want to sign. And it's a statement of values um, for ourselves. We've had some great feedback on this so far. I think my favorite was from Owned Broadjun, who quoting a fellow tra traveler activist said, uh, what's timely is usually long overdue. And I suppose that's how we all feel about it in this project, that while it is, it's timely and exciting that Words Ireland is a collective is working on this area, we're also, it is way overdue. And when we start something, we start it in a dialogical way. So this charter, when the Words Ireland organisations come together to sign it, which I expect will be early in the new year, it is only then the start of a conversation, which will require regular and meaningful update. I suppose the other final point on why this charter isn't a thou shalt not and that must always is because Words Ireland is just that it's a collective. Uh, they don't have a mandate over each other. They can't police standards for each other. Um, but what I'm going to do is invite people to offer any further reflections they have on the Charter today in the last few moments of our discussions. We'll give about 10 minutes at the end of the, of the webinar. Or you can email us comments to Info Words Ireland up until the middle of December, after which I hope we are slowly shutting down their computers. Um, and as I say, it will be adopted by the Words Ireland organisations early in the new year. So you'll be relieved to hear that's the No Lynch show over. But before I invite in our first panelist, are there any questions on the project itself that people feel will be useful to raise now? Lovely, and Brendan has just put in the comments box. Thank you, Brendan, that comments can go in there as well. Okay. So without further ado, and two minutes over time, which isn't bad, I'd love to invite in Deborah Kelleher as our first presenter. As mentioned, Deborah is the director of the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Their new strategy has diversity and inclusion at the very center of it. Um, and for me, what I think is particularly exciting is that they are literally creating new art forms in the way that they're approaching inclusion. So Deborah, thank you. Thank you very much and really congratulations on the work that you've done. It's so important and resonates hugely with what we're doing in Adam and other sectors. So what I take from this is 
we're addressing a systemic problem and a systemic problem needs systemic change. And if we're all doing it at the same time together, that's the critical mass that is actually required to make great change. So I hope you do magnificently with your own work. And I'm delighted to share just an overview of our case study, maybe where we're coming from a little bit. Um, and I hope that you enjoy the story. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, the Royal Irish Academy of Music, for those of you who don't know us, was founded in 1848 as a national conservatoire for music, notably classical music and the Irish harp. I joined the Academy as director late in 2010, and that was in the teeth of the recession. So there was so much firefighting going on from 11, 2011 on you know, cutting staff by 18% and ghastly things like that, that it was hard almost to get your head above the parapet. Um, at that time, we became an Associate College of Trinity, but at the back and the forefront of my mind was always, the Academy of Music didn't have a quest. There was something rudderless about us, I felt, after I joined. And knowing my wonderful colleagues and what they'd achieved over the past 30 years, over the past 150 years, bringing you know, open music education to people so you didn't have to have a private music teacher, bringing in professional diplomas for teachers in 1930, bringing in a nationwide exam system to set a curriculum in 1894, bringing degrees to music uh, so you didn't have to leave the country if you wanted to be a professional performer and study for that in the 1990s. I felt we were missing a, a quest, a purpose, and something was passing us by. Now added to that, we had the great impetus in a positive way of Creative Ireland, and then looking for more community engagement, more reaching out. And suddenly we were thinking, okay, we're pretty isolated here in this national institution. Are we really for everybody? And the answer to that question was getting uncomfortable. And then a couple of years later was the Me Too movement and everything that that on packed in terms of power relations because you're right Rose uh, Nolene we have a we have a, a on the one hand some interesting projects to do with opening access to music but on the other hand you're dealing with a very real and problematic power relations imbalance that can undermine that so actually we have two projects on the go that address these so when it came to Creative Ireland we wanted to play our part and when we looked at what we did in the academy we could see that was with inclusion and diversity. That when we looked at the, the census of what is the population of Ireland, that actually we were not reflecting society outside our doors to inside our doors. So having done some research, we started to see really inspiring examples in the area of people with disability engaging with music participation and performance. I'm talking about Claire Cunningham, the amazing choreographer. I'm talking about Karen Power, a very wonderful Irish composer, Christian Lundberg, who wrote an opera um, for musicians of a variety of disabilities that was incredibly powerful. So suddenly we were seeing a different aesthetic, something exciting for the 21st century that had high artistic values and that we would um, like to develop in our ourselves, saw partners around Ireland, and we eventually connected with the Ulster University, the um, Athlone Institute of Technology, and the Cork School of Music, MTU, the Cork School of Music. And in a partnership, we formed ensembles called the four Lakela ensembles. These are four ensembles of musicians predominantly with intellectual and physical disabilities who can engage in music creation through the use of technology. So software, iPads, iMacs, these kinds of um, components that could help them find their unique voice. So each individual would create their sound and make their contribution to an ensemble. Now these four ensembles then unite for a residential and perform as the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland. It is the kind of the equivalent to your, your youth orchestra, your national youth orchestra that you might've gone off to at Christmas in the summer. The experience we want to be um, 
as rich and as exciting as that. So for the first performance of the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland, our four provincial group met in Athlone. They had a number of days residential in a hotel in Athlone where they worked on a musical performance by day and they socialized and integrated with each other at night and it culminated in September 2019 in the inaugural performance of the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland. For me, what's exciting, and you did touch on artistic excellence, is the definition of what excellence is and how this is in fact quite a narrow narrative, particularly in classical music. So, you know, Richard Wagner and Franz Liszt did a bit of a number on us back in the 19th century because they implied that virtuoso being a, a musician that could play like a Premier League footballer was actually the pinnacle of achievement in music. But whereas someone like Bach had a pretty decent career and he was doing the births, marriages and deaths, he was a teacher, he was a composer, he was a performer. So we, we narrowed down in the 19th century what our definition of excellence is and artistic excellence is. And now we have the opportunity to broaden it again and to say, well, what experiences are there? Not just saying, you know, well, this doesn't have to be good music anymore. It is, what is good music? It is a, an emotional and aesthetic reaction to something that really works. And if you look at the works of say, Karen Power or Christian Lundberg, you can see that these are successful and beautiful artworks and that's what we're trying to achieve. The Open Youth Orchestra have to get quiet during COVID because these are vulnerable individuals, but we are planning uh, back in action, back in um, the, the, the outer world as soon as we possibly can, because the more they perform together, the more we understand how to develop our artistry and our new aesthetic and to reach greater uh, levels of artistic excellence. Now, we are a training institution. So what we aspire to for our participants and our students is that our participants, we would like them to get credited a level five certification. And as an associate college of Trinity, we hope that we can get them on their certificate um, program so that they can actually aspire and work in a, in a workforce based on this incredibly intense work that they've been doing. For our tertiary students, we hope to do uh, modules where they can um, learn how to be um, tutors and mentors in inclusive creativity, which is the word uh, phrase coined by Frank Lyons in Ulster University. But there's also a job to do in bringing over the, the sector. And this goes to the second project that we have, which is about power relations. So here we have this gorgeous project, the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland, and everything that it means in potential of redefining excellence and developing a new aesthetic. How exciting is that? But what is uh, playing in parallel and potentially against it is the sector that has the Franz Liszt definition of excellence and that anything that we try to do could arguably undermine or ruin classical music or our own our own identity as musicians. So in 2018, the Association of European Conservatoires, the AEC of which I'm a vice president, decided to try and address power relations and balances in conservatoires. A conservatoire is based on the master apprentice model, one-to-one -one teaching. And that allows for a lot of intense creativity and wonderful work but also a kind of an unquestioning authority. And the abuse of that authority, unfortunately, um, has been found out. And we now have heads of conservatoires internationally in prison for power abuses. So the Academy has led a research project funded by the EU called PRIME, Power Relations in Higher Music Education. And this is forming um, a citizens assembly model because even deciding who would decide, who would form the charter, who is in discussions about this is a power relations issue. So we've taken 60 participants from 10 institutions who meet four times to discuss particular issues with papers presented by unbiased or as unbiased as possible experts. And it's chaired by one chairperson, just like the Citizens Assembly works. And what we're going to try to do is not dissimilar to what you're doing, which is to create a publication, but also a charter that addresses power and balances. 
the areas that we're looking at are, uh, for instance, gender and sexuality. They are looking at artistic excellence and the definition of it. They're looking at socioeconomic um, issues and how that will be. And the first assembly, which was just back in September, was about defining power relations and empowering the stakeholder assembly to have those discussions and to come at the end with recommendations that we would hold our sector. You're right to finish up, Nolene. This journey has really profoundly affected what the Academy is. We've articulated in our 175 strategy, which goes between 2021 and 2025, and in the middle is our 175th anniversary. The work that we've done with the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland that we're doing with the power relations is really turning our expectations of ourselves on its head. So in our four goal plan, the very first goal is access and inclusion for a modern RIAM. So what we're saying is we're putting down a marker to say we've achieved a lot, but going on into the future, the means by which we achieve greatness must change because it must include um, a much broader variety of people. I remember Michael D. Higgins in his nation reaction speech in 2018 said it a barrier is not just saying, okay, here's a door, you can walk through it. It is reaching out and creating conditions in which when you walk through that door, when that barrier is broken down, that there is a recognizable and demonstrable um, reaching out and welcoming of to whom your culture and your institution were off limits. So in the academy, we're doing a, an, an audit and we're doing a journey plan for access and inclusion. We are working with research uh, on an EU level so that we're not just making it up and reinventing the wheel. And we anticipate that we will grow and be more open over a period of five years of the plan, at least to start to see some good and some change. For us, the value of something like the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland is to have flagship signal projects to say we're signaling change here so that we can get the systemic change right on a cultural level, but that we can also start to put markers out, visible markers out, that things are changing in a national conservatoire for music. Uh, I hope that that was somewhat coherent and that you can understand what we're up to. And I am happy to take questions now or by email afterwards. Thanks. Deborah, thank you for that extraordinary tour de force. I now have a triangle in my head that has power, artistic excellence, and real lives and real work in it as well. And I think for me, that element of that the, the, the academy is using, it's re, redistributing its power to ensure that the artists that come up through these initiatives aren't just the flag bearers, but have the opportunity to live and earn and continue to create, create great new music is really extraordinary. Um, some lovely comments coming in, but I'm very happy to open it from the floor. Chandrika, very much appreciate the focus on power imbalance and acknowledge of how that breeds abuse, encourages gatekeeping and prevents innovation. Um, thank you for that, Chandrika. Please do put up your hand if you would like to ask Deborah a question now, or we'll put all of our questions to all of our panels, panelists in our discussion. Okay, I don't have signals. And thank you for the generous offer, uh, Deborah, of taking people's comments after the event as well. Um, RIAM is the RIAM 175 is on the RIAM website. Um, and you can also find some extraordinary materials on the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland. Um, I'm going to abuse my power as the chair just to say that I have heard that 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 block about artistic excellence and capital L literature quite a bit in my conversations. Um, there is something about being the gatekeeper of an art form and those of us who hold very rigidly to those gates and what we consider to be the capital L of literature, the capital A of artistic excellence. And I think we are a really interesting example of how you just explode that myth. 
Um, Deborah, yeah. thank yeah. you. I am going to check this comment. Great talk from Susan Lanigan. Thank you, Susan. I feel like drive time now, reading out the happy tweets. Thank you, Susan Lanigan. Um, we are going from hopeful to more sober. Some of this won't be new to you. Anyone who is serious about needs to be very familiar um, with the work of Speak Up and the, again, a journey that is really only just beginning. So I'd like to hand over to Siobhan Burke, co-director of the Irish Theatre Institute, and to Dr. Kira Murphy, who is the lead researcher on Speak Up, a call for change. Women. Thanks so much, Nolene. Um, I'm going to start and talk a little bit about um, the research findings, I suppose, and um, the statistics and the impact of that in kind of conversation with what yourself and Deborah were speaking to previously. And then I'm going to hand over to Siobhan um, and she can give some insight as to where we're going to hopefully go next with this. So, um, Essentially, this is going to be quite sober reading um, and listening and the power dynamics that we've been talking about um, are very much part of uh, what I'm talking to here today. Um, so as you might be aware or not, the findings of the recent Speak Up A Call for Change report demonstrate um, that the Irish art sector, quite widely speaking, has a significant problem. And I'm going to run through some of the key findings of that, but I'm going to specifically focus, I suppose, on perspectives of diversity and inclusion as kind of part of this uh, really important project. So the statistical analysis of the Speak Up survey uh, found some quite troubling things. Um, and it indicated that there's a culture of harmful workplace behaviours across all sectors in the arts in Ireland, and that the levels of experiencing and witnessing these behaviours are similarly high across all sectors, which means, I suppose, that we really need a cross-sectoral method of engagement and of improving uh, these dynamics. This has massive implications for the sector in general, um, and it presents a very difficult to overcome barrier to participation by arts workers in general. But it's really the intersections of these experiences that highlight certain how certain constituencies are facing heightened barriers to inclusion in Ireland's art sector. So I'm going to summarize these findings now um, before examining gender employment status and sector more closely. So the majority of those surveyed experienced um, and witnessed harmful behaviors. So 70% indicated they experienced and 53% said they'd witnessed harmful behavior. The majority of these instances were reported to have taken place in the workplace. Um, and according to the data, the perpetrators of these behaviors were more likely to be men than women. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the gender dynamics of this in a while. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that here. Those who experienced these behaviors were much more likely to be women than men across the majority of categories. Um, and men were slightly more likely to witness harmful behaviors than women, uh, according to the data that we collected. Um, the data found that women were more than three and a half times more likely to experience sexual harassment than male respondents and were more than twice as likely to experience sexual assault than male respondents. So the sexual nature of harm um, is obviously like an, a massive barrier to inclusion in terms of like arts participation among arts workers. And there's a very clearly gendered dynamic evident here. <sighs> Freelance workers, this is another issue that was something that we sort of expected in a way, but we couldn't um, prove it essentially without uh, doing the necessary analysis. And obviously, like pay and work conditions are a really significant indicator about participation and how long people will stay in the arts uh, force and how and the quality of their work. So freelance arts workers are more likely to face harmful workplace experiences than those who are not freelance. Um, and according to the respondents, the majority of perpetrators were reported to hold positions of authority over them as well. So here's this power dynamic again, this gatekeeping. There's often no consequences for those who perpetrate harm on others in the arts sector. And this is something that I suppose is one of our most stark findings, one of the most troubling findings. Um, and the respondents to the survey reported that um, supports were not available to them often. And even when they were, they weren't sufficient. And so most respondents who experience or witness the harmful behaviors analyzed in this report stated that they weren't comfortable seeking support in a professional setting. So, I mean, a, a huge barrier. I want to talk very briefly before I pass back over to Siobhan about, I suppose, the intersections of gender, about sectoral sort of like spread and also about employment status. So we took a look and I have a few graphs here um, 
just to kind of like put this visually, I suppose, um, we analyzed the relationship between experiences of harmful behaviors. You can see there on the slide. Um, and behaviors that undermine the right to dignity at work and gender. And so those who identified as female in the demographic section were much more likely than men to have experienced bullying, harassment, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. And as I said, three and a half times more likely to experience sexual harassment and twice as likely to experience sexual assault. It's interesting, I suppose, that male and female respondents were similarly affected by experiences of assault and victimization, um, and male respondents were more than one and a half times more likely to say that they had no experiences of these harmful behaviors um, compared to, to women respondents. So that's 22% compared to 13%. We probably expected the gender dynamics in a sense to kind of like come out as starkly as they have. But as we know, paying conditions play a large role in informing diverse participation in Ireland's arts sector. And so 63% of respondents to the survey indicated that they work in a freelance capacity, which in a way makes sense because of the heterogeneous nature of um, arts work. But also, um, this is a key finding in that when you analyze the relationship between experiences of harmful behaviors that undermine the right to dignity at work and employment in relation to freelance status, freelance workers were significantly more likely to experience harmful behaviors in every category. And so this is compared to respondents that didn't identify as freelancers. Um, they were much more likely to experience sexual harassment than non-freelance respondents and much more likely to experience humiliation compared to the general respondent cohort as well. And they were also far less likely to respond that they hadn't experienced any harmful behaviours compared to the rest of the respondents in the survey. So it's clear that freelance workers are more vulnerable to instances of harmful behaviours in work within the arts sector. So paying conditions have a significant role to play in terms of diversity, inclusion and long term participation and safe participation in Ireland's art sector. It might relate to increased precarity and job security. And obviously, this is a massive issue at the moment in Ireland's art sector around kind of the COVID-19 restrictions. But also, I suppose other workers will face precarity, you know, other contract workers, employees and students, not just economic precarity. And um, when you have these positions of power and this kind of gatekeeping, precarity can crop up in other ways. What I suppose is particularly interesting and quite grim <laughs> is that when you look at how experiences of harm vary across different sectors within the arts, you'll see that there's actually quite a similar pattern of experiencing and witnessing behaviors across all of the sectors. And so it sort of looks a little bit starker than it is on the graph, just in terms of the small number of responses in some sorry, categories. Sorry, sorry, Kira, you've actually got the wrong slide up because we're looking oh. at freelancers. Would you ah. this? Perfect, thank you. Thanks, Siobhan. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't think sector is a significant contributor to the likelihood that a person will experience or witness harm. But what is clear is that there is a consistent and pervasive problem across the arts sector, which is demonstrated by the overwhelming majority of respondents reporting that they have experienced or witnessed harmful behaviours that undermine their right to dignity in the workplace. And so I'm just going to pass over to Siobhan now in a second, but I want to say that um, there are some limitations here that it's important that I highlight due to the structure and scope of the report. We weren't able to analyze with confidence the intersections of workplace harm and ethnicity, disability or gender beyond the binary. And we hope that efforts will be made to analyze these relationships in future research because it's extraordinarily important that those intersections would be um, analyzed. But what's clear is that certain constituencies, namely women and freelance workers, experience harm at higher rates than their counterparts, demonstrating that gender and employment status provide a barrier to participation across Ireland's art sector and as we've heard already um, in various different ways and the power dynamic inherent in these instances of harm where respondents talk about how their perpetrators were in significant positions of power this also plays a role in this dynamic and as Nolene alluded to in her intro it requires us to consider how we can get our own houses in order regarding who we listen to who we place in these positions of power who we fund so further research training and high level intervention are needed to hold perpetrators to account and to begin to remove the barriers to participation for those in Ireland's art sector. Because again, Nolene, as you noted, we need to ensure that the onus is passed away from those who are suffering kind of constantly and negatively towards organizations and institutions. Um, so they need to be made responsible and accountable for keeping arts and arts workers safe. We need to change that balance of responsibility now. But I'll pass over to Siobhan Burke now, who will talk a little bit more about the recommendations um, and next steps.
Thank you, Kira. Um, just to say to everybody that the full report, Speak Up, A Call for Change, is available on the Irish Theatre Institute website. It's been widely promoted in social media. Um, do contact us if you haven't got, if you would like uh, a link to it or uh, you have any questions on it. Um, it is, there's about 50 pages of um, data and analysis in it. And, um, you know, there's loads more information in it than what we've been in position to present uh, this morning. But just, uh, we thought it would be important to kind of give you a sense of what the recommendations were. And I'm going to read a small bit from, uh, from our final words, uh, just to kind of put it in context. Um, the following recommendations identify where action and cross-sectoral focus is needed to transform workplace culture in the arts. Committed and meaningful leadership alongside accessible and sustainable sectoral supports, capacity building programs and oversight are all key measures that must be put in place to embed the, culture, the cultural change required. Dignity in the workplace is the right of every artist and arts worker. Harm perpetrated by one person on another across the spectrum of behaviours outlined in this report has a lasting, lasting impact and the supports and measures provided must respond to the range of behaviours experienced by people. These recommendation, re recommendations outlined a shared way forward, creating a safe and respectful working environment for everyone who works in the art sector. And the important point here is that we're talking about a spectrum of behaviours. And in the report, we identify that spectrum of behaviours. Um, so I just want to very quickly go through some of the key points in the recommendations. The first recommendation is demonstrate leadership and build cross-sectoral support for change. I'm not going to read out all the actions we've identified. I'm just going to pick out a few key things. Part of that, the number one re um, recommendation there in terms of an action is that we must mobilize sectoral and institutional leaders and key talent to stand up and publicly support this work. That is an absolute necessity. I have to say, guys, there's been a lot of institutional um, I wouldn't say reserve, institutional reserve, in terms of being seen to be out forward and central supporting this work. And we must all work together. And um, we're hoping, you know, we have a lot of contact with all the work, Words Ireland group, and I'm not picking out Envy in this, in this group, but in general sense to say that um, uh, this, this work can often seems to land in silence. And we do require people to come together and we will have meetings where as resource organizations, we can all work together on this. But we need to identify key talent and the artists need us. They need us to find key talent who can stand up and say, this work is important. You must pay attention. The other thing we could say is very few men have attended um, our sessions and we've been running them since 2017. And we have to do much better on this front. We cannot run these events. I can't see the gender breakdown in the column on now, but we cannot run these events with only 10 or 15% male participation. In fact, I would say and speak up, we won't run another event if we don't get closer to 50% participation in the meetings. We'd have to cancel it due to circumstances beyond our control because we cannot be seen that this is only a female issue. It would it, it make nonsense of all these campaigns. So we must do better. I um, in some, it, it, we must do better. So in terms of audiences uh, at the events and, and we, we really need to watch this space. It was um, really quite shocking and was brought back to us by a few men who were on the call when the minister launched our report less than a month ago, that of the 165 people who were on camera and who you could see and you could identify, less than 10% were men. And at one moment, less you could count in one hand the number of men on the call. Um, like for another day, but this is this is a really big thing, sector leadership. Um, and you put that into the com into the conversation that at the points that were made by Deborah and others earlier, Kira too, about power imbalances and who has who has the power and who's the leader, who are the key talent, and you're facing a very stark conversation. Um, with ourselves, but I'm a great believer that change will happen with a lot of great people on side. And I think it's going to be down to each individual person, each man on this call, as I said in another meeting, to call 10 others and say, the next time one of these are on, you need to be there. You absolutely need to be there. 
Um, so that, that's the first of the actions under the, the sectoral support. Uh, and there are two other uh, um, points that are just are worth mentioning, and they are that we publish and share a dignity in the workplace code of behaviour. Um, we have one in, uh, that we developed for the Speak Up programme, and we would probably, um, with, with other art forms and with other organisations, possibly develop a, a template that everybody across the arts could use. Um, we need to create an online register uh, that, for organisations to show that they have signed up to the code and that they are actively um, working it. The second recommendation was to strengthen the reporting and support systems. Um, and as part of that, we're developing uh, with the department and the Arts Council in Screen Ireland, where we, there will be a standalone website, which we, in time, it'll take us a few months to develop it and to have it working to the standard that it should be at, which will be kind of a workplace toolkit, which will have all the resources um, that, that an artist or, or a, an employer um, in the sector would need in terms of working uh, where to get information on how to be supported um, and also guidelines um, on how to uh, to, to uh, have proper workplace um, workplace workplaces properly manage workplaces um, we also would be very keen to introduce an anonymous centralized reporting facility um, modeled on the some existing examples that are there in the third level sector and that's um, that's an action that we are currently working on with the department. It, it may take a few months to actually roll that out, but there is very good third level experience in this area and there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And so we're, we're working very closely on that one. And then moving on to recommendation three, which is pursue consequence for non-compliance. Um, this, this is all about, we need to see that there are some consequences for organizations that have a very poor track record. Um, and part of that as a first step is for the agencies to introduce uh, a requirement that on the receipt of um, the public funding that you self-certify and you self-certify to say I have had nothing upheld against me and that my organization has had nothing upheld against it. You may say that's a very low bar and it probably is a very low bar but the feeling is we have to start somewhere so we're going to start there. We're going to start with nothing upheld against you and that would be our starting point. Um, and then as part of that that conversation around consequence, of course, bleeds into the conversation that Kira mentioned earlier around precarity and the freelancer. And we need to be paying um, attention to that, about how people, when they do come forward, how they may be affected or how they may perceive they're being affected by having blown the whistle or, or made a disclosure. Recommendation four is around building capacity, capacity to promote a dignified workplace culture. Um, and this really is about the future. The, the, in, the entire um, program that has been Speak Up is actually all about managing the future and making a better future and creating a better world for all of us in our workplaces. And so in terms of building capacity, we're, we're again um, keen and the recommendation is to build training programs and training tools um, to assist arts organizations and artists to address the dignity in the workplace issues. In the theatre and performing arts, we're very keen, and it actually will work across all art forms, to introduce um, training in the area of um, bystander training. So in theatre, what we realise now, five years on from when we started this work, is that there are people who, would I, who, who carry what I would call um, bystander regret or bystander ang anger or um, essentially bystander upset, essentially that they witnessed something a number of years ago and they now realized through the mm. conversations that they were unable to act and why were they unable to act? And so the need to have training in this is something that we, 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 we all need to address. And part of that training is that we do a train the trainer program. And this is, these are kind of the actions that with the agencies, i.e. with the Arts Council and Screen Ireland and the department, they're actively looking at ways in which we can put this kind of training in place. It's likely in ITI for the performing arts, we, we, we might do a pilot, a pilot uh, um, scheme in this regard, and we've worked very closely with Alwyn Daw, who's also on this call, and Professor Louise Crowley, in terms of teasing out what actually are the issues for bystander, because there's another table in the program, in the, sorry, in the report, which um, um, says that the number one, uh, it, the number one um, experience people have is actually the bystander, and that is, the, that is one of the places where men, is the experience of most men, 
is actually the bystander. Um, but all of us have had bystander experiences and we feel we have been unable to, to address them. And finally, our final recommendation is the need to do more research. Um, and this, is, as you all know, has been one of the, the uh, key uh, call, uh, calls from the Campaign for the Arts, is to have, there'll be further research in the arts. Even though 1,100 people, um, they were self-selected, of course, 1,100 people came forward and, and fully completed the survey, and they, the survey is based on their experiences. We can't say whether that represents 1%, 3%, no, whatever, 0.5% of our sector, because nobody knows how big our sector is. And as a sector, we absolutely need more information. So we were calling on the essentially the department um, uh, to basically enable the research to be carried out to work out how big our sector is. So we can talk with certainty about who we are. We can map who we are and know who we are. And part of that is we want to um, get, get everybody on side with the idea that every three years we will run this Speak Up work survey and we will try to find a way in using the same kind of template and there may be some small variations for a variety of art form reasons, but the main template will stay the same um, so that we can, every three years, see how we're doing, have a comparison and have some sense, kind of sense, are things getting better? And also at a very basic level, that when we call the meeting at the further, when we call the meeting to give the report, that there's a better gender representation as well as diversity representation on the calls. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Kira, for that very sobering work. Um, I don't think anybody can have the conversation about equality, diversity and inclusion without looking at home about what's happening right now. Um, and at a personal level, one of the one of the things I sometimes hear when I'm working on EDI projects with organizations is, oh, well, this is all very new. And these are new communities and those artists haven't emerged yet. And I go, well, we've always had women and we've always had freelance workers and people that don't get paid. Mm. So that is the power dynamic that we're dealing with right now. Mm. I'll be damned if we're going to invite more vulnerable people into a sector that hasn't pulled its socks up in order to fulfill an EDI objective when we're not looking after the people that we currently have. There's, um, I think I just overstepped my Marcus chair again. I do apologize. There's a comment in the comment box that I want to share with the room, which is from Susan Lanigan. And that additional point about when people do try to speak up and the experiences they have of being silenced in that regard. Susan, thank you for putting that in the comment mm. box. I think that warrants it, uh, an entire debate mm. of its own. And I think it's going to be a challenge for every organization to stand shoulder to shoulder with people and also to navigate the extremely complex laws in that area in Ireland. But thank you for raising that in the comments box. I just wanted to give that voice to that in the collective. I am going to, so um, Kira has also very kindly put up the link to the research and invited, fantastic. But Lynn, I'm going to offer you the unenviable task of perhaps raising our spirits a little <laughs> and telling us about your own work as Lynn Scarf, the, the advocate, the passionate advocate that I've, I've watched over the years, but specifically now in, in your role as director of the National Museums, huge institution in Ireland. Where do you think we're going and um, what can we learn? Thank you, Nolene. And um, <clears throat> I suppose just to say thank you to, to Kira and Siobhan, for um, that presentation and, and uh, very sobering presentation and in many ways, um, while sobering, I think energizing actually, because I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a reminder of the importance of the work and a call to action even more so. So thank you for that. And thank you Noni for asking me to speak this morning. And um, so um, I suppose, uh, uh, as Nolene said in that nice introduction, I'm the director of the National Museum of Ireland um, and I've been in role now in the museum for just over three years. Um, I took on the role as director in the museum just when the museum had gone through quite a kind of public experience around bullying and harassment um, and, and also some cases around sexual harassment as well. 
And um, I think that, you know, what I'm going to share this morning is not really specifics necessarily because it wouldn't, I feel, be appropriate around that that work, but more about the, the two things that I think have come up this morning, that balance between the structural work that we need to do within our organizations and the programmatic work that we're doing with our audiences and where those two perhaps meet um, and, and the journey, I suppose, that, that I've been on personally and my colleagues have been on um, as well over the last number of years and where we are and where we're going. And um, hopefully I, I, it'll give you a, a few insights. So I've, I've just put a few slides together to just really keep me on track, but hopefully it'll give you a little bit of illustration of to where we are. So if you just bear with me for a moment, um, I'm just going to try and share them. Okay. So, um, can everybody see those there? Yeah. Okay. And I will just go into slideshow. Great. Are they still coming up there, Nolene? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I start with this slide. I suppose I'm when I'm speaking this morning, I'm very much speaking from the context of museums um, and 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 that that kind of collecting institution, I suppose, for want of a better description. Um, and I suppose I put this one up because my thinking ar around it is, is we talk a lot around participative and inclusive museums and that work. And it, it's, it's more than being an inclusive space. In my mind, what we're really doing is we're trying to, no more than Deborah mentioned in her, in her conversation um, with us earlier, we're actually trying to deconstruct some traditional paradigms that exist within our institution, um, particularly institutions that are of the age that we are, you know, like, like RIAM, the museum is an institution established in 1877, you know, so what, what we're effectively doing is, is deconstructing that notion of the authoritative museum. Um, and that, I think Deborah touched on this this morning, but it's also obviously very much coming through a lot of the reports that, or, um, and the data that Siobhan and Kira were showing, that structure and then the kind of power that that lends people in positions of power within those institutions has, has and continues to have quite significant effects. So while there's an element of, of what we do programmatically, fundamentally, we're talking about changing the culture and changing our organizations. Um, and so that is a significant uh, piece of work um, and a journey. And um, I put this up because, well, hopefully I think, you know, as Nolene said, let's, let's you know, mm -hmm. be hopeful. Um, this has always interested me. Many of you might know that when, uh, Donald Trump was first inaugurated, there was a lot of conversation in the cultural sector in the US about how to respond. And a lot of museums shut for the day in demonstrations. They closed their doors. And the Guggenheim took a slightly different approach. It stayed open and it put out Yoko Ono's wish tree and it invited people who are passing by to write their wishes and to hang them um, and to talk about the future. And I put this up because for me, it's a very simple demonstration of what we can do oftentimes as organizations with our collections and with our work to get them out so that we're engaging with people to tell us what they want for their future. And I think we have, a, as institutions, we have a big role here. And I think as collecting institutions, we have a role to use our collections in that regard because I would be, I'm within, you know, within arts and culture, I think our art forms are so important and, and in being vehicles for us to have these difficult conversations at times that aren't polemic, that are very much inviting people to talk through the work that we're doing and making sure that the work is being done by um, diverse groups of people. So, I, I just put this up as a kind of thought, if you like, for where we are and where we should be going. Um, the other piece that I wanted to discuss a little bit this morning that you know I think about a lot within the work we do in the museum is, is the terminology and the words that we use um, and why we use them and what, what they can mean. So um, 
within the museum sector, we talk about a lot about inclusive and participative programming. We talk about the democratized museum. Um, we talk about the relevant museum. And we also it, it very much at the moment talk about the about decolonization of our museums, particularly in the context of ethnographic collections um, and repatriation. Um, and oftentimes for, for institutions that can seem um, th there's so much coming. And, and I think that actually what I wanted to get across today is that most of that is sitting again in this question of challenging the structures of our organization. And actually the museum that is working towards developing more inclusive programs and thinking about that both at a programmatic level and how it works with audiences is also thinking about it, it should also be thinking about it at a structural level. And that's also going to have impact on its relevance in many cases, in the case of our own museum, around decolonization and questioning those colonial structures that still remain from, from organizations like ourselves that are hundreds of years old and what that means in terms of reaching out to, to, to communities. Um, I put this quote up because, and, and just this link, and I'm happy to share these slides afterwards, but the, this particular link around the Future Museum Project, I think is very interesting in terms of, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing blog inviting people from the sector to put forward you know, thoughts about what the future museum would be um, and, and what it looks like. And I think it's, you know, if it's, it's just worth having a look through it and seeing these different perspectives globally around this kind of question of inclusivity and, and, and participation, but also fundamentally around, you know, diversity within our sector um, and equality as well. Um, so if I just, um, so, Again, going back to that structural question um, and thinking about the work that we do within the context of where we are. And this kind of comes into that point that was being raised earlier on by Nolene and again by Deborah around artistic excellence. Um, and this is um, a table that I've adapted from Stephen Heppel's work on 21st century learning. He's a, a, an educator based in the UK who in, in the late 90s, early 2000s was working a lot with technology and learning um, and kind of developed this sort of model around 20th century learning to 21st century learning. And if you like, I've taken it again and adapted it in the context of cultural institutions and their work. And I'm not saying that what's on the left is bad and what's on the right is good. But what I'm saying is, is if you like in this table, that in some ways this sort of indicates the journey that many cultural institutions and arts organizations might be on. Certainly institutions like the one that I work in that are you know, over a hundred years old. And it's that idea of, of the work that we do. And I think it probably reflects a bit on those questions of artistic excellence, particularly as you go down the table, but thinking about us being, you know, these large, slow moving, very reactive organizations to being a bit more fast and proactive and trying to be early adopters to being models of interactivity to being much more participative. So working with our audiences and the outcomes being directly involved by that work with our audiences, being more ablative in the way that we do our work as opposed to dative. So, you know, not, you know, the people are um, collaborating, co-curating, co-producing work with communities, being more porous and less enclosed. I think one of the things that for me within our organization that has changed as an organization is that we tend to look out more than look in. And while that might seem uh, like a very simple reflection, it's, it's really important for us actually, and for, for, for our team um, in terms of the work. Thinking our, of ourselves as creative platforms as opposed to just content providers. So in the case of cultural institutions, I think of us often as being you know, within this overall ecosystem and we are costly big institutions, but because of that, we should be creative platforms. We should be places that are supporting arts and cultural work and that are in some ways being the platforms that lead out on projects and programs around diversity and inclusion and, and enabling those and using those resources in that context. Thinking of ourselves as a meeting place, thinking of ourselves as networked. And maybe this last one is kind of, 
going into that artistic excellence. And I use the word amateur here in the context of the museum world. So I, I, I understand that that might not resonate as well in terms of different, but um, I suppose recognizing, as I like to call them, the professional amateur, you know, and, and, and thinking about their contribution, their role, how they co-produce, how they work with us. And, and we would see that a lot in my sector in terms of historians and so on, you know, recognizing that, making a place for co-curating and co-producing co work. Um, I'm not sure how many people are maybe familiar with this, but it's something that I've been using a lot over the last three years. It's quite an old equation. Um, it was developed by, by Danny Miller in, in 1980, actually, but it's, we all hear that phrase over and over again, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And this is, um, I have this on a post-it uh, on my wall in my office. And I'll, what I'll just go through. So C is, is change. So change um, is equal to D, where D is dissatisfaction by vision, by first steps needs to be greater than the resistance to change. And why I bring it up here is that when you're leading in an organization, sometimes you get very frustrated by things just not changing. And you're putting in all of this energy into the system and you're trying to find a way forward. And actually what, what you've done is you've provided this really good vision, but you haven't given anybody any kind of implementation plan about how to get there. So you've missed the first steps or you've provided this really good vision and you've provided an implementation plan, but you haven't fully engaged with everyone. Some people don't, aren't dissatisfied. Some people think this current circumstance is, is perfectly fine. Thank you very much. And so that you need to get in underneath that. And I think, you know, Kira and Siobhan did a really good job of bringing that up this morning in terms of the context of their work, Who, who's at the webinar? you know, who's there and, and, and maybe enough of that D is missing and, and you're not getting that. So it, I just shared it this morning because I find it a very useful tool. Maybe it might be useful for people here in terms of just sometimes helping you zone in um, on, 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 on where you need to put additional energy or where you need to open up the lid and spend a bit of time digging through. Um, in terms of the museum itself, you know, we, you know, the, we sort of developed a strategic plan in 2019 that was trying to, in various different ways, address all of these elements across the organization. So we had a kind of capacity pillar that, and that was very much looking at the human resources area. So we had a whole, you know, redevelopment of training for everybody that managed within our institution. Um, we redeveloped every single policy within our organization. Um, and we did two kind of external audits on our human resources and the way that we worked and so on. So that was quite a significant piece of work and that continues, it's, it's by no means finished. Um, and we also then started to look at the way that we developed programs, who decided what programs happened within the organization. So who decided what exhibitions went forward and how people got to submit ideas for exhibitions from within the organization. So that's also changed. We now have an exhibitions committee. Traditionally, that was a very closed unit that made those decisions within the museum. And now it's a committee that spans people across the organization. And it doesn't necessarily have to come from the curatorial end. It can come from within our education teams, from anywhere within our organization, ideas for exhibitions and programs. And there's certain, rec there's certain requirements in terms of those. And we ask for things around co-curation and co-production um, and so on. So we've had, interestingly, that has had the knock-on effect of most of our programs in the last two years being co-curated or co-produced in some capacity. Um, and I've just put up some images here um, as examples around things like Rainbow Revolution, um, the work that we did with um, amazing artist Alison Lowry um, around addressing our uh, hidden truths, which is still currently running. We actually, that was a temporary exhibition, but we were actually able to acquire Alison's work for the National Collection, which just was a wonderful thing to be able to do because it's such important work talking about Magdalene laundries and industrial schools and will be a big feature of our upcoming 20th century history of Ireland. Traveller's Journey, which was, um, I know, 
Nolene mentioned Owen earlier on, Owen de Bardoon, who was very much involved in that. And actually, that's another example. We subsequently got a significant grant from um, the Department of uh, Justice and Equality, and we now have um, been able to, well, we're just actually running a competition, to hire um, a, a new curator around our traveller collections. Um, and obviously, we're hoping that that will be from the traveller community, and that's certainly our intention. Um, and so these programs are seeding into the structure of our organization, I suppose is, is the key point, but I'm conscious of time. So I will, um, I will, I will jump on. These just are some of the things more so in terms of the participative programming than the structural end of things, but they sort of both interlink a bias for action because, you know, it's never going to be perfect and you need to just go and support your talent and the people who are putting their hands up to do this work. Um, building capacity, changing policy, governance, so important. I have an amazing chair on a board who came on the journey when I started and having that leadership is, is critical um, in this process. Fostering collaboration, genuine um, be behind the work that you're doing. I, I, I talked here, I talked about it a bit earlier, but involving the objects, involving the collection, involving the artwork, um, that it's a, a, a an organization wide journey in we talk about it's everything from how we pick up the phone to how our attendants welcome people when they walk in the door and we still got a long way to go on that within the museum believe you me we're only on the beginning of that journey designing for participation thinking about it in terms of the physical sense as well as um as well as the words that we use how we refer to ourselves um, how we talk about our collections, understanding, you know, increasing risk appetite. I, I think people talked about the need for ongoing reports and evaluation and research, and I couldn't agree more. I think that's one of our failings within the sector is we do wonderful programs, but we very rarely take the time to look at them and say, okay, what were the learnings here? What were the challenges? Um, and thinking, one of the things that I particularly, I, and I'm, I'm just going to jump to the last one, is about changing indicators. I work in a sector where the driving force indicator was always number of visitors. How many people did you have coming through the door? And in some ways, the silver lining of COVID has been that that's been turned on its head and, and it's enabled us to kind of look at depth of engagement. But I still think we are doing ourselves short of good indicators of this kind of work. And I think that probably goes back to that research question. And I think it goes further into that, how you set up really strong research practice collaborations that are long and deep and allow us to demonstrate this work much better. Okay, I, I probably have gone over time, Nolene, my apologies. So I will stop sharing and jump out and hopefully that's given people some food for thought. And just to say thank you so much to all of the other speakers, I've learned a huge amount this morning, thanks. Lynn, thank you. Um, I never cease to be amazed at your capacity to be both an artistic leader and a really rigorous scientific thinker. Um, so you were talking to us about the symbiosis between structure and programmatic work, and you just gave us an object lesson in how to apply that. Uh, that formula will be on my desk in the future and maybe on others. We have some comments in this. Yeah. And I think, Lynn, people will be looking for those uh, slides. It'll be wonderful if you could share them. That's very generous of you. I am, rather than um, open it up for general comments, I'm very conscious of time. So it's 16 minutes past 12, and I promised you all you'd be out by 12.30. So I'm going to jump straight to Maureen, if that's okay with you, Maureen. And just to take a breath, everyone, and reflect on you know, you're also relatively new to role, Maureen, Mike, and for so many of us, so much of this is happening in our new COVID world. Um, what patterns do you see? Um, and where do you see the Arts Council both supporting and also pushing the sector? Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Noli, and thanks, everybody. And great to have the opportunity to be here this morning. And like everybody else, I'm I'm inspired by what I've heard. Like it's, it's been sobering for sure. We've used that word a few times, but it's also been very, very inspiring. And I think gives us great optimism for the future. When I was thinking about today, um, two quotes came to mind. And I'm sure lots of people here might have read Claire Keegan's brilliant new book, small things like these. So there's a, a, a really, there are many heart stopping lines in it, but one that came to me was 
and for a whole day or more, Furlong had gone around feeling a foot taller, believing in his heart that he mattered as much as any child. And I know in the work that you all do there, that's something that you see every day. And that's that's something that gives me optimism that we can change it. You know, we, we are now getting to a situation of diagnosing how exclusive the arts landscape has been. We're now coming to a recognition of that and, and the work that you are obviously up for doing is going to help us enormously in, in changing it. The other line that came to me was um, Annie Fletcher, the director of IMA last week at a brilliant event in the, in the courtyard in IMA with participants from the Family Resource Centre from St. Michael's Estate, which was uh, marking gendered violence over 16 years, a very, very powerful, simple, beautiful event. But Annie quoted Maya Angelou and saying, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. And those of you, again, in the literature sector, but all the arts obviously involve stories are, are doing that and are intent from everything I know and from everything I hear, particularly here this morning, your intent on uncovering those untold stories. And again, that gives me much cause for optimism. Just maybe a few quick reflections on, on the particular presentations um, this morning from this morning. Deborah's point about doing it all, us all doing this together is going to give us the power. And that's that's how we're going to change it. Um, and it caused me to reflect that here in the Arts Council, we make choices every single day about who gets funding. And you make choices and the artistic choices and the business de decisions that you make have to have inclusion and diversity at their very heart. And it's only by mainstreaming those um, principles is that's that's how we're actually going to change the landscape. Um, so we're, we're in because obviously the Arts Council is a historic level of funding now, and hopefully that will continue. I'll be very optimistic about that. We're in a very good position where we can actually change the landscape because we have this increased investment. And now we have this, what feels to me like a very shared objective to, to change the landscape. So I feel, I, I feel very optimistic about the future. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Siobhan and Kira gave a very good look at the, the Speak Up um, survey, and we're obviously meeting with, with Siobhan and colleagues frequently about this, and there are very practical things that we, we can do from the Arts Council's point of view, some of which Siobhan mentioned in terms of the sub-certification, also training and, and governance, and these are things we'll be looking at very energetically next year and we'll be working with Screen Ireland and with the department on those and just acknowledge uh, Alwyn Dawes on this call I know has done great work with with the group there and also to acknowledge my colleague Audrey Keane from our literature team who's also on, on the call um, and then just coming to what Lynn was talking about um, I was particularly struck by by that um, infographic that you showed up there Lynn about museums in the 20th century moving from enclosed spaces to porous and porous is a word I think that we're all it's a word I like very much and it's the paradox of the arts sector having to shut down because of COVID but that causing us to reflect on how much more porous we all need to be and how much more porous we actually can be because now we have time to reflect we have a feeling of who's outside the gate for all those years. It, I think it's a real wake up call. It's a real, it's a really shocking thing for us to contemplate who has been outside the gates. And because now, you know, pandemics have changed the contours of, of our lives in the past, undoubtedly it's gonna happen in the future again. So we really have an unprecedented moment to make that significant change. Um, I wanted to maybe just finally talk about um, one of our values in the Arts Council. We have five values. One of them is accountability. And in order for us to hold others accountable, we need to hold ourselves accountable. And when we have that degree of accountability, that is going to foster development of trust. And developing that sense of trust is going to make us unified and it's going to enable us to collaborate together in a truly significant way in order to make that change happen. So I was just going to leave it at that for the moment, Nolan, but I'm happy, obviously, to, to answer any direct queries anybody may have. 
Thank you, Maureen. Um, there is one, oh, there's one very long uh, comment in, in the comment box. So I'm going to, okay, okay. And um, Susan, at the risk of oversimplifying that, because I'm speed reading here, I think, and I'm sure you would agree, Maureen, for me, sometimes it feels like the Arts Council's head is catching up with its heart. The Arts Council has, has been very clear about its values in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, but no more than the National Museums or the concert hall that I worked in. Uh, they are big institutions that move slowly, move almost at the pace of the size of the building. And so we need to change in all of those micro spaces where we might be unintentionally excluding people, like in the, in the language that we use in application forms. Or indeed, as we move forward, funding just across art forms is, a, you know, in art forms as opposed to across art forms, funding the artist themselves and removing those different ways that we all um, have boxed people off. Susan, I don't think I'm doing your comment justice, so I'd encourage people to go into the comment box and read your words, not my very woolly interpretation of them. And I see Alwyn is also taking that question for the Arts Council, so that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, we have six minutes and we were going to discuss the charter. So I'm going to pop it up on screen um, only by way of saying this is, as I said at the outset, the start of a conversation collectively among Words Ireland, um, among those seven organisations. The organisations don't purport to represent anyone other than themselves or indeed to be in any way representative of the literature sector. Um, but that charter was our first best effort to name some shared values. So I'm going to pop it up on screen just as we're closing out so that people have it. And if anyone wants to stay in the room and either email us comments on the charter or you can email them to Brendan afterwards. I'm going to put it up as the final slide, but I'm going to use this opportunity to thank you all for coming here today to thank Deborah, to thank Siobhan and Kira, to thank Lynn and to thank Maureen, to thank everyone who worked hard in the comment box asking provocative questions, to thank Brendan who's behind the scenes actually running this project for Words Ireland and Aoife in Children's Books Ireland who has managed the tech end so that the rest of us can actually breathe. Um, I hear a lot from women in the arts sector that they don't want to be the white university graduate women taking up the space here. Um, but you're the people doing the work. Don't let it stop you. And um, there are great women who happen to be white and happen to have university degrees who are in positions of power right now and they're changing things. So don't let it stop you because I think we learned today there is a great deal more to be done before we even get our current dynamics right. So on behalf of Words Ireland, can I wish you all good health in as much as can be expected right now, peace of mind in as much as can be expected right now, and most importantly, joy and pride in your work as we hopefully slowly wind down towards the Christmas break. Thank you all. I'm going to share screen. Feel free to send us comments on this charter for Words Ireland. Thank you.
would you believe we actually have three minutes? So we're not going to talk. Wouldn't do that to any of you. We have three minutes until the meeting closes. If you want to leave, if you put your comments in the comment box, either on the event or on the charter, feel free to leave. If not, the call will naturally shut down or automatically shut down at 12.30. Thank you all. Joseph, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was calling Joseph um, Sesame in the comment box. I do apologize. I get called Nielsen, if that's any consolation. <laughs> <laughs> 